Welcome, Dr. Goswami. Our next speaker is Mr. Aniket Ghansham, who is with the Government of India's Waste to Wealth Mission at Invest India, spearheaded by the Office of India's Principal Scientific Advisor. The mission addresses India's environmental challenges through innovative technological solutions. He completed his degree in environmental science from Drexel University in the US and an MSc in urban water management from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. He has provided environment related services to the Meghalaya state government and the government of Nigeria. We welcome Mr. Ghansham. Our final speaker is Mr. Rakesh Tiwan, currently senior general manager with the Muthoot Group corporate office in New Delhi. He looks after corporate social responsibility and corporate communications. A certified associate of the Indian Institute of Banking and Finance, he has more than 50 years experience in the banking and finance. He retired as general manager of a public sector bank where he has headed its information technology division. He has also been senior faculty at the bank's training college. Welcome Mr. Devan. I will now hand over the session to the chairperson to deliver his own address and to conduct the proceedings. Hello. It's a pleasure to participate to, to the conference and I asked Mr. Moses if we could reduce uh, the AC here. I feel a little bit cold and also we have to reduce climate change. Um, all right, so we, will tr we are between you and the lunch, so we will try to be fast. And uh, let me introduce myself uh, again. I am a head of the EU European Union a delegation on research, innovation, and education. So actually, uh, we have three great speakers on three different topics. Um, I will just therefore give a very few comments. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, while I was preparing for tonight, for, uh, I, I was contacted by an Indian student who is li living in the US, studying in Harvard, the health uh, uh, impact due to climate change. And he was telling me, Mr. Perik, I am Indian, I study in Harvard, and I would like to make a PhD in Europe. So I felt it was extremely interesting, a young, uh, a fellow who is really global. Today the world is very global, that's why the, 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 the seminar uh, is very important by the global dialogue. And in fact, I, am, I have the honor myself to be a G20 delegate uh, as a European Union representative. And this issue of South and North, this issue of global and multilateral is major. I would like to say, uh, to conclude, that in Europe, we have really taken great, great consideration on the global South situation and also on energy and environment. The, the current conflict and war that we have in Europe is putting it again to us who are, we, we, are, we are more developed countries. So don't believe that you are the only one to have issues. Don't believe in India that you are the only one to solve the issue. We in Europe are together with you in India and in the global world uh, at tackling this. So without transition, I will go to the first speaker whom we have introduced, and uh, thank you very much. We will try to be brief, but you have the panel, and uh, at the end of the three speakers, we will have a little discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Monsieur Fion, and um, good afternoon to you all. Sorry? Can you compare for the huh. this one? No? Yeah, the green one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Thank you. thank you. And I would like to thank the organizers at the very beginning for making me a part of this very exciting platform and uh, dialogue. Uh, now, a few points right in the beginning. One is that, yes, I am, of course, a climate scientist, and I have been involved with that, but I also put on a hat of uh, being in the policy. That's primarily because of my last assignment in uh, CSR laboratory in Delhi. So today I am going to talk more from that point of view. Uh, the second point is that I'm going to address primarily the uh, theme of the, uh, you know, the today's uh, 
seminar or conference, it's not seminar, sorry, I shouldn't go into the seminar mode at all, so I should be very brief. <laughs> okay. so, uh, um, <clears throat> so therefore, you know, it is addressed with the uh, industry in mind. And what I mean by that, when we have industry in mind, uh, we do not bring in alt altruism or, you know, uh, things of that sort. That's for another platform for another day. Uh, we have, uh, therefore, ROI in, return on investment is in, and altruism is sort of out for the moment, okay? But we keep it in our in mind. The other point is that uh, uh, I'm not going to be India-centric. I'm going to talk about North-South divide in a very global sense. So there are, again, other platforms where we can discuss specifically about India, which uh, I'll avoid at the moment. So now, uh, uh, this, of course, you already know. Uh, let me see where it is. Uh, yeah, I can start from here because people have talked about it. This is the north-south divide, as you all know. It's basically like the equator, an imaginary line that it divides the uh, you know, north and the south, in, mainly in the terms of economic terms, and that also in the GDP terms, not actually like purchasing power parity or anything like that. It's a very gross line. But it gives you an idea like why uh, uh, you know, this uh, question has come up of north-south divide. And I must say that India is somewhere in a very uh, you know, shadow region. Uh, it is uh, at economy in transition as well as you know, technology in transition. Uh, so we will keep that in mind. So therefore, once again, uh, I will not be India-centric, but uh, a global north-south uh, perception. So uh, in this divide, uh, if you may call it, uh, technology is a major driver. And it may not be the you know, panacea for all problems, but as you will see, uh, technology is going to play the critical role in either bridging or enlarging this divide between North and the South. So uh, the, if you look at some of the parameters, like trade and industry, urbanization, industrial revolution, transport, communication, adoption of new technology, in all of them, South uh, has been quite low, whereas the North has been, in some cases, pioneer, and in some cases, definitely very high. <clears throat> but what you ca cannot probably see from there, now you come to, for example, natural resource. In natural resource, now it is, has become a gray area. It's a question mark. Uh, are we in the, you know, which is high and which is low? And I'll tell you why. Especially when you come to renewable uh, resource, renewable energy, uh, the question of this divide becomes very tenuous uh, because uh, wind power, for example, uh, or solar power, as some other earlier speaker has pointed out, uh, the uh, south may be richer uh, than the north because uh, so many of the southern countries are in the tropical region and they have more solar power. So therefore, in terms of solar power, south might have become richer. And so, of course, demographic uh, resource, uh, south is high because of higher population, but quite often it is considered as a burden or as a drawback, but I think we should look at it also as a resource. Uh, this is just, a, uh, you know, for example, if you take in wind energy, this is just to, uh, you know, reinforce the same point uh, that the distribution is now different and uh, the global distribution of wind power, for example, shows uh, richness in many other areas which were not considered earlier. Uh, and it's very evolving very, very fast. This is a between 2012 and 2016, and you can see that a global atlas of wind power alone, for example, has changed dramatically. And it's going to change even more. And this is not just harness power, this is a available power. So, and if you see this uh, wind energy distribution, for example, you see the Germany at the top, uh, but India is like one, two, three, four, and then many of the European countries are actually further, uh, much further down. So a, the whole scenario is changing, and the question is that how do you take advantage of it, and what is it that still maintains this divide between North and the South? So uh, this is what would happen if by 2050, if you could go to a 100%, transition to 100% renewable energy, uh, again, what you cannot see is the line below is that you would lose about 27 million jobs if you go to 100% uh, renewable energy, but you will create 52 million jobs. 
So that is what we need to aim for, and again see what it is. And then, of course, you have this, uh, the, there is an economic divide, but there are united challenges, uh, which are, you know, we need to collective uh, knowledge, uh, wisdom, as well as expertise of the whole world. Climate change, of course, it knows no boundaries. Pandemic knows no political, it's not a region of climate change. Pandemic is not, at least COVID was not a result of any climate change, but it is a global challenge. Pollution, again, doesn't stop at any boundary, so it makes you, you know, necessary to have collaboration. So these existential global challenges have to come from science and technology as well as policy. So what are those you know, technologies and policies? So therefore, uh, I talk about science and technology in this north-south divide. Uh, the, the main problem, which has already been highlighted, so I'll be very brief about it, is that uh, the inequalities in funding uh, and you can say in some ex uh, to some extent dissemination or you know recognition now as i said when we were addressing our sustainable industry we have to take into account the fact that the industry has to be sustainable it has to survive if it gives away all the profit and all the money uh, to you know it's going to die away so that is accepted however uh, to, we have to see how to boost capital flows and improve research collaboration so that these new technologies which can help, like for example, renewable energy, become accessible in the South in a more efficient manner. And uh, so therefore, this, what has happened is that it has reduced the effectiveness of our collective scientific responses. And it is ineffective use of intellectual capital globally available it also constrains scientific research to narrow paradigms from a select number of cultural settings and perspectives. And it overlooks the fundamental importance of local context, which was again highlighted in an earlier talk. So therefore, an effective and sustainable North-South technology collaboration holds the key. And this is what I am going to uh, propose, and uh, I'll end with that. And what is this North-South technology collaboration? Uh, this is what is called technology leapfrogging, uh, technically. A good example is a mobile telephony or uh, um, you know, renewable energy. You don't go through the whole developmental cycle. You don't use the handset. You go directly to the mobile. So you, have, you technology leapfrog. You don't go to the conventional electrification. You go directly to renewable. So that way, the divide gets uh, you know, narrowed in a shorter time. Okay? So that is what we need to uh, look for, one thing. And also these, uh, these new technologies that are coming because the industry has become sensitive. Uh, as you know now, they already talk about ethical investing and ethical, you know, the, you already know the advertisement, I am doing my bit, so kind of thing. It's an example of, you know, ethical investment. So therefore, these are the, uh, attracting this ethical investment and they go all into this achieving SDGs and, you know, response to climate change and what we call climate buyback. Okay, we destroyed Amazon, you buy it back from the nature. Uh, put investments, buy it back. So uh, no need to despair, it uh, just needs collective uh, effort. So therefore, I <clears throat> would like to suggest that there should be a North-South SNT collaboration fund for an organization. It's a dedicated fund, just like uh, you know, G8 Belmont or other, some of the international funds, where you have a mandatory, uh, where you have a, uh, I don't know, how am I going back? No. Uh, technology is letting me down. What is it? Okay. Uh, um, Ah, you can just go back to, uh, two slides down because it should it should work, but it's not working. But anyway, I I I don't want to take up time. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that it should have a uh, this particular initiative, if you may call it, should have a mandatory north-south collaboration, and should emphasize certain things. Like one is, for example, a kind of a, you can say handholding or you know technology transfer or a consultancy. Okay, can you go back here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, you know, there are three things basically. One is what is called the enhancing the technology readiness level. At the, in the South, technologies are often researched upon, developed, but they stop at TRL 3, technology readiness level 3. To go to the in, uh, market, you need to go to TRL 8 or TRL 9. 
So there, this kind of collaboration will help. Similarly, you know, you can have, you have to cross the valleys of that. You may develop a technology, but then it needs to be taken to the market, needs to be tested. So again, you know, this kind of collaboration will be able to help. So basically, we can uh, yeah, work out uh, these things, but that is what I feel is needed. And there are some very, very interesting areas which are coming up, and which is, for example, like bioeconomy is one, renewable energy, of course. Bioremediation of waste is another uh, potential areas. So this is what I uh, wanted to propose to you uh, for uh, thinking over to trigger your thought process. Thank you very much. We will have the second speaker, Mr. Aniket, who is working, in fact, more on the policy aspect. But let me just make two comments before you can go to the slides. Yeah, oh, you speak for me. Okay. Let me make two comments. Just uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goswani. Uh, I can take two ideas that you have. The first one is to look at leapfrogging and disruptive technologies. Yesterday, I was, in fact, as a G20 member uh, at the education uh, G20 group, and we were clearly looking at this the leapfrogging, the disruptive in countries, especially like India, the next G20 presidency will be Brazil, and the after next will be South Africa, where you have a large populations. So how we solve issues in countries that have large population, we need disruption, and we need leap, leap, leapfrogging. What was very interesting, it was we need leapfrogging of technology, but maybe leapfrogging of policies how governments can adapt to a policy that is not on the table yet. So maybe Mr. Aniket will mention a few, a few ideas. The second and last is uh, putting and working together. I think you have a great idea to put a, a, a fund together, but usually for governments, it's extremely difficult to get money out of the country. So what I will promote and what the EU is doing is promote the mobility of scientists. And it must be a circulation. It must not be, should not be a brain drain. So you in India are going to be uh, a, a, an engine in terms of brain circulation. Because all with your high population of students, you have 300 million of students in India. We have 90 in Europe from age zero to age 30 until PhD. So you will be the engine. You will have a big responsibility but also we will definitely look not to have a brain drain. This is obvious, and it will help the joint work that you were mentioning. Maybe not necessarily by having joint funds, but we will see. So those are two ideas that I put on the table, and I give the floor, and we will discuss this later. I give the floor to Mr. Aniket. You speak from, from the table. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to start by thanking Global Dialogue Forum for organizing this wonderful summit and for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's a real privilege and honor to be sharing a stage with such a distinguished group of individuals. Um, so as you're all aware, India has exhibited rapid economic growth in recent years, and this has brought significant economic benefits to our country. However, it has come at a significant environmental cost. So to give a few examples, Kolkata, Mumbai, and New Delhi are in the top 10 most polluted cities in the world as per their air quality index. And Delhi air pollution has been reported to cut the lifespan of its citizens by 10 years. Now, sustaining a reduction in particulate matter pollution by 25% would see India's life expectancy increase by nearly one and a half years and would increase the life expectancy of Delhi citizens by over two and a half years. Now, I understand that India must progress forwards and continue to expand its economy and industrial capacity. However, we must ensure that our industries are not only profitable, but are also accountable for their environmental footprints. We as a nation must prioritize the preservation, conservation, and restoration of our natural resources, such as air, land, and water. And this is actually something that the Waste to Health Mission at Invest India is undertaking. And the mission identifies technologies in the solid and liquid waste management space, and we aim to provide potential solutions to some of our greatest environmental challenges. Now, the Indian government is prioritizing the clean energy sector, and according to this year's budget, $4.3 billion is being set aside for clean energy. And the big focus for this was in green hydrogen production. Now, the government has bet big on green hydrogen with a $2.4 billion investment, and also they have set up the National Green Hydrogen Mission. Now, based on current trajectories, 
Green hydrogen could become a widespread energy resource within the next decade. It is actually also three times more energy dense than gasoline and can, and can be produced from renewable uh, sources. Climate Technologies received $1.2 billion in investment from 2016 to 2020. Most of these investments were seen in the renewable energy and electric mobility sector. However, in 2022, within the first two quarters, $839 million investment was received. This shows an exponential increase in funding activities. And this investment also showed a much greater diversity. It included other sectors such as waste management, climate smart agriculture, and energy efficiency, along with the other sectors that I had mentioned. The government has also set aside 10,000 crores to set up 500 waste to wealth plants to generate energy and valuable byproducts from cattle and organic waste. This will create new livelihood opportunities and increase on incomes for people residing in rural India. Some of the other things that we also need to address is the carbon market and create a proper mechanism for the trade of carbon credits. The Bureau of, Bureau of Energy Efficiency and Agency of the Government of India has stated that by 2030, India will be the largest carbon market in the world. This needs to be expedited and Indian companies should be allowed to gain recognition and promote their sustainable practices. In addition to carbon credit programs, greater incentives for corporations are required to ensure the, promotion, pro, the promotion of sustainable development. Tax incentives for corporations and individuals that invest in sustainability, in sustainability should be envisaged. Certification programs for companies that have undertaken emission cutting measures and invested in sustainability could also be explored. These programs would allow companies to display their commitment to reducing their emissions and the environmental impact of their, commodity, uh, of their commodities. Such recognition would differentiate them from their peers. Now, one of, the, one of the points that had been brought up earlier by Dr. Mathur was the development of technologies. But one thing is that there's already a lot of technologies in the market that we are simply unaware of. So one of the uh, programs under the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor was the Cleaning and Restoring India's Water Bodies Challenge, which took place in 2021. Now, essentially, in, during this challenge, we invited companies related to improving water quality and improving uh, and, and cleaning rivers. We asked them to present their solutions to a jury that consisted of experts from industry, academia, and the government. Now, a, a, a company was identified under the challenge and was uh, given recognition by the office of the PSA. Now, to take this a step forward, maybe these programs could include pilot projects to test selected winners and identified under the challenge. These pilots could then be utilized to test and val validate the efficacy of the selected technologies. Those that perform adequately can then be scaled up across India. Similar challenges could be conducted by relevant government departments to identify players in the market that could help alleviate India's environmental issues. So in many cases, in, uh, addressing environmental challenges can result in cost savings and ultimately lead to being more lucrative. So I'll give an anecdotal example. I went to a cluster of textile mills in Gujarat a few years ago, and there was one individual who was looking to address his textile mill's water consumption. They had set up water recycling and water treatment units and managed to reduce their water requirements. The area was already suffering from water shortages and groundwater levels were decreasing. So in addition to his own efforts, this person spoke with the other owners in the textile mills and tried to convince them to invest in setting up their own water treatment facilities or using his and letting him expand his facility. Now, some of them were eager to participate in this endeavor. However, I remember there was one person in particular who displayed no interest at all, and he was okay with calling 20 private water tankers per day to meet his water requirements. Now, this will end up being, end up being more expensive in the long run, which is something I suppose he did not consider at the time. So while the initial cost is frightening to business owners and governments alike, with regulations and incentives in place, people like the person that I met in Gujarat will hopefully become the norm and not the outlier. And this is something that, as a nation, we must strive for. We also need to create supply chains for products that have been recycled or converted into other, uh, into other commodities. So there is a solid waste management plant in Karnal in Haryana that converts fresh organic waste into compost and converts plastic bags into pellets that can be used to construct furniture. The compost is provided free of charge to local farmers and is sold at 1,500 rupees per ton to traders and farmers coming in from other cities. So now compost buyers from Uttar Pradesh and other parts of Haryana have come to purchase this compost. This goes to show that not only are people willing to use these products, but they're willing to pay for them. The point here is that we need to create supply chains for reusable commodities. A UN report stated that 50 million tons of electronic waste are dumped every year. This e-waste produced annually is worth $62.5 billion, and this is more than the GDP of many countries. There is 100 times more gold in a ton of e-waste than there is in a ton of gold, of gold ore. So there is potential to tap into this and create supply chains to extract valuable materials and reuse them. 
Not only will this generate a circular economy, but it will provide economic benefits to industry, government, and consumers alike. Lastly, I'd like to conclude by saying while, there are, while other methods to treat our waste, clean our water, and reduce our water consumption, our emissions, and improve air quality may seem like a large capital expense, it may not even seem economically viable. However, not addressing these environmental concerns will come at a significantly higher economic cost down the road. Its effects have already been disturbing worldwide. The origin of the Arab Spring has been partially attributed to drought, so we must take the necessary steps to address our environmental challenges and incentivize sustainable investment to reduce our emissions, reduce our water consumption, and provide living conditions for our, uh, to, to provide better living conditions for our citizens. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You gave interesting uh, illustration examples. Um, before passing the floor to, to the third speaker, I just wanted to maybe emphasize something that we in the Western world uh, are definitely feeling, is the speed at which resources are being consumed. Yesterday, in fact, I was sitting with a representative of Australia, and she was telling me we, are using, we have used last year in 2022 the, for cement consumption in the world the same amount as in the previous 15 years. We have used in the world in last year more wood than in the previous 15 years. So this notion of speed is also probably an element that we policymakers have to integrate. The deprivation, the use of environment resource is dramatic, not because it's happening, but because of its speed. So let me make that point very clear, uh, and we will discuss it probably. But with tr without transition, I, I would like to, to introduce a third speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Rakesh Diwan, and thank you very much. I just will let you speak, but when we discuss, I was um, very interested because I am not from India, but, and I didn't know that Mutut is 800 years old. So it's, uh, yes, we need history when we speak about the future. And the second point that we discussed, you and me, it was very interesting. He, uh, uh, Rakesh told me, yes, in India, we have 65% of the population under 35 years old. So you have 65% under 35. And I say for us, it's reverse. We have about 35% of our population above 65. So when you look at the mathematics, the mathematics matter. Uh, so remember, 65% of young people you in India. can see that. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. But for us, it's starting to be the opposite. We have between 20 and 35%, depends on the country in Europe, that one third of our population is above 35. And two thirds of yours is below 35. So let's see at the demographic uh, situation, uh, which is impacting technology uh, production, but also technology use, and, and transition. So without more, more comment, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rakesh. You are representing something interesting on this panel, which is more the view from a large company and with a social responsibility. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I proceed, we will have a small video. Please watch this video. Food Group is a multifaceted business conglomerate comprising 20 diversified business divisions. Today, it takes pride in serving over 2.5 lakh plus customers every day and catering to more than 72 crore customers, including repeat customers on the strength of the trust earned by maintaining high standards of corporate governance and unchanging values in changing times. The Muthut Group is among the first business conglomerates to integrate sustainability with growth. More than 800 years of community service and environmental conservation date back to a time before the term corporate social responsibility was even coined. Today, with its modern and progressive methods of conserving energy, reducing carbon emissions and other ecological initiatives, the group has taken concrete measures in this direction. The group's corporate office located at Alaknanda, New Delhi and its 5,840-plus wide branch network is fully equipped with LED lights. 
A few among these branches also have glow signboards, harnessing solar power to maximize energy efficiency. In education, the St. George's School Alaknanda is the first and only school in the Delhi NCR to have 100% solar panel system. It has installed a dedicated rooftop solar panel system to generate green and clean electricity which meets 100% of the school's power needs. To promote the adoption of green energy alternatives by society at large, 15 solar street lights each were installed at Todarpur village, Varanasi, Uttar Pradesh and Dhana, Manisa, Gurgaon. 50 tribal families of Mysore were distributed solar home lighting kits. Among its efforts to reduce electricity costs for public buildings, it supported the installation of a solar power plant at the Kerala Museum in Edapalli, Kochi. As part of service to the community, a 24 kW solar panel system was donated to NAB, India Centre for Blind Women and Disability Studies, Hoskas, New Delhi, to sensitize Generation Next on the imperativeness of green energy. 450 solar lamps were donated to tribal students at Hanuman Vidyalaya Secondary School, Vetpal Village, Osmanabad, Maharashtra. In line with the government's thrust on environment-friendly mobility solutions, the group has set up electric vehicle charging units in association with Kazan, a leading electric vehicle charging network in New Delhi. In leisure and hospitality, Zandari Pearl Beach Resort at Marari Kullam, Kerala and Cardamom County at Thekkade, Kerala have EV charging stations installed within their premises to enable the use of electric cars. By July 2023, these resorts will have solar power plants to meet 60% of their electricity needs. And currently, all Zandari resorts have switched over to energy-efficient lighting technology (LED lights) as part of maintaining a sustainable ecosystem. The Muthut Group, with its customer-centric businesses, sustainable practices, and uncompromising values, is always ready to do its bit in taking India forward. Thank you. I think you have seen that what Muthut Group is doing. Uh, let us see that uh, how we are working. If we go and see that our children, that environmental sustainability should go hand in hand with development of a balanced growth and secure future. We at the Muthut Group have centered our business operations and growth around sustainability, though adoption of green energy and by supporting ecological conservation. Today, I feel honored to represent the Mathur Group on this prestigious platform that has taken the responsibility of engaging key state stakeholders in dialogues, debates, and discussion over a range of issues concerning our world. As business leader, we like to be at the front line of initiating change by introducing and implementing programs that support the government's measure at countering environmental challenges while enabling sustainable industrialization. As they say, changes begin with you and to effect that, we have ensured that our corporate office with mo and more than 5,800 branches are fully equipped with LED lights. Even the glow sign boards of some of our offices harness solar power to maximize energy efficiency. To propagate the message of the adoption of green energy and sensitive people from the grassroots level, we have given villages and the tribal population access to solar power. As part of our socially responsible initiative, we have donated a solar power station to National Association of Blind and a school for the tribal students in Maharashtra. Seeing the exponential potential in implementing electric vehicles on Indian roads, we have partnered with Kazam, a leading electric vehicle charging, to set up EV charging station in Zele. We are in the process of replicating these and introducing new plans and projects that fulfill our dual goal of sustainable development and environment conservation affecting our present and future. The Mathur Group is one of the India's largest business conglomerates and it hard in place to give people prosperous life through sustainable development. In fact, sustainability is in our DNA. If you all see the SDG 22 report, it is talking about effect on the industry 
due to COVID-19 and climate changes globally which have led to crisis. It has mainly affected the developing countries. If we just go by this, uh, industry was affected and many of the people, they stopped their industries, closed their shops, there was retrenchment, there was mass people who were asked to go. In this crisis, Muthoot Group stood tall and in the pandemic also, we have recruited 10,000 people from March 20 to March 23. 10,000 people. We started online recruitment and online training because we are a digitally inclusive group. So we could do that without much hassles. In fact, uh, these changes have reversed the progress of eradicating poverty and hunger. We at the Mathur group provided help, food, nutrition, clothes, anything which was required. We provided 250 houses for poor and uh, underprivileged people in Kerala, Haryana and Uttarakhand. We provided medical equipment to all the hospitals throughout India, wherever it was needed. We came out with a 16-bedded hospital in Kanpur. So, this is what we have been doing to ensure that people who are underprivileged and poor, they are helped. You all know that uh, we have served 720 million people who have availed services from us and daily 200, uh, 2.5 lakhs, you can say, people come to us. And our final aim is that we have to be better than the best and different from the rest. Namaskar, Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for very uh, to the point presentation. I appreciate very much the resilience that Mutud had. You gave an example uh, during the COVID crisis. During the COVID crisis, uh, you were right. The industrialized world, the west part of the EU, was very, very much affected. All, everybody, industry, society, hospitals. But uh, in India, you have showed a great, great resilience. Let me now move to maybe a few questions and a panel discussion for 15 minutes. Um, could uh, uh, anyone below 35 uh, able to put, uh, uh, put a question <laughs> or above 35 is also accepted? Uh, I will take one or two questions and I will complete myself. Anyone from Valeo, do you have a question? Uh, dear Director General, President of Valeo, you have a question to our panel? You are also from industry? Yes, or Lieutenant Archer, please. No, no, I'm, uh, thank you very much. I think it was very interesting listening to different viewpoints. No questions on this one. Thank you. Thank you. So we will take definitely questions. Otherwise, I will designate people yeah, to. Uh, to yes, please, lady, ladies first. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so my question is about the carbon market. Uh, I think Mr. Ghansham was talking about it. Uh, so you mentioned that by 2030, uh, India is going to be, uh, you know, have one of the largest carbon markets in the world. Uh, this was very surprising to me because uh, when we generally talk about the carbon market, we talk about it in reference to, you know, European countries, and we rarely hear about it in context with India. Even when I'm talking about like uh, newspapers and stuff, I don't ever remember reading about the Indian uh, carbon market in very uh, detail. So can you like shed some light on this area? Um, so that statement came from the Bureau of Energy and Efficiency, which is uh, under the government of India. Um, having worked in the office of the PSA, carbon markets and carbon credits is actually taking uh, more, in, uh, is being given more importance. Uh, we've actually had conducted many meetings uh, with different players in the space. And uh, industries themselves are also showing a lot more interest in terms of adopting this um, because we are trying to now really promote green growth, not only in the government, but uh, also with all the industries also trying to do the same thing. Yeah, thanks. Yes, yes, please. 
I think one lady from there. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Just to substantiate yeah. what uh, the speaker has said. Uh, the uh, talk about Indian carbon market has taken uh, momentum and uh, BE has already published a draft report about uh, the mechanism and uh, the market that will be in place. So you can search and you can have a lot of knowledge about carbon market and ministries. Um, uh, uh, I'm working with CERC, Central Executive Regulatory Commission, and uh, CERC is also closely involved in the creation of this carbon market. So. Okay, so um, uh, good afternoon to everyone. So my question may be answered uh, uh, by Dr. Pr uh, Prashant Goswami. So uh, my question is that since this uh, dialogue forum started, we have all been talking about the um, uh, sharing of the technology, pooling of the technology. And uh, Dr. Veena Jha also uh, said that, uh, talked about the free exchange of germplasm. So my question was that, uh, the concept of patenting uh, 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 was adopted by India. It started to be implemented in India in 1975. So uh, this sharing, the, the all that we are talking about, the sharing and the pooling of the technology or the germplasm, how can that be achieved? I believe that it's not very easy to achieve. As a I challenge. suppose not very easy, but then uh, it would be good. But then let me make one point clear. Uh, there are two ways to approach it. One is that say that, you know, on a moral ground, no, no, we must all share everything, you know, on humanitarian ground for equity and so on and so forth. And the other approach is to make it industrially sustainable. And since uh, this summit is regarding, you know, industry perspective, you can in a way say, let's talk about that first a little bit. So not about altruism but how it can be done without industry losing its profit or return on investment, right? That is the crux of the matter. So uh, now to do that, for example, if the, you see the, uh, when a product is developed, especially through R&D, it goes through a number of stages. One is that you can, and those are defined in terms of technology readiness levels. Whether it is a, before it goes to patenting, it has to go through all of them. So one way it can be done by allowing north-south collaboration, maybe through a trust or maybe governmental effort or maybe CSR, you know, whatever it is. That is a different discussion, of the mechanism of it. But if you do that, then you can actually help those technologies being developed in the south to reach that maturity level of TRL 8 and 9. So, and then only you can go for patenting, right? So take them to the level of patenting before their competitor somewhere else gets that thing. And the second one is, of course, in many of these uh, technology developments require funds. And these funds are quite often controlled by the uh, organizations in the north, okay? So if we had a mechanism, then we could support them in developing those uh, you know, technologies by providing funding on a, on a you know, on, genuine basis, not just because we are giving it to them as a thing. And third, as I said, is to call, cross the valleys of death, as they call it. You have it here, but then to go to the next level, it, most of them fall down and they die, and those are the valleys of death. So again, this kind of north-south uh, collaboration can help them to cross those valleys of death. And of course, technology translation. You have a technology here in the north, and you want to take it to the south. But when you want to take it to the south somewhere, you want to have a digital marketing taken from here to Cambodia, then you need to have customization. You need to bring in features which are suitable for local you know, uh, requirements. And th those are the ways it can be done, okay? Is it clear to you? I mean, does it answer your question? Okay. okay. One or two more questions. If not, yes, 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 please, at the back, madam. What I would like to say is that uh, it's one thing to say we need these mechanisms and that sort of thing, but at the end of the, this conference, we need an action plan which then we can, with which we can propose to the uh, part stakeholders concerned as to what needs to be done, time frame and all that sort of thing. Otherwise, it will remain in terms of something verbally said and then nothing comes out of it. Yeah. Yes, I appreciate very much your, your comment. And let me add 
something concrete, an example. I was speaking uh, two weeks ago. We had uh, the G20 of foreign ministers and the Resina dialogue uh, at uh, Taj Palace. And I was speaking um, with Amitabh Khan, the G20 chapa. Amitabh was very prominent saying that India is feeding a market need of um, um, an evolution. You have diet, you are fully in the digital society in India. Everybody has a mobile phone, everybody is using uh, macro financing, Paytm, whatever. But I was telling him, when will it be possible, and we discussed it in the session before with Director General of Terry, that when I buy a new clothes, when I take a tuk-tuk, or when I take a flight, how much emission do I produce? Why don't we have, at the level of citizen, solutions that give us uh, a, an idea of what means climate impact on health, on biodiversity? So why Indian young scientists here in the room, uh, young Indian economists, are not able to produce for the world that kind of uh, a real system that shows the impact of an individual decision on a system, on a global system. So maybe I can ask the panel this very difficult situation, but we in the world must solve it. We in the West world will not solve it alone, but we must feel that it's, as, as you say, and this is why I bounce back, it's not only an action play by policymakers, it's very simple instruments given to the citizen where they can feel when they make a choice. If you don't buy, if you say, I, I don't go in 23, I don't take the plane. You have a certain credit, so then maybe you have a certain allowance to have a two or three shots. But if you are in a, in, a, in a decision mode where you want three or four new shots per year, you want three or uh, uh, flights, you want to, you can't, you can't. And we, we can't at each individual level. So maybe let me ask that difficult question or understanding to Professor Goswani, because I want to know if in India people are, are sensitized on this question of choice. You are in an economic growth, but you please don't make the same mistake as we did in the Western world where you want to have everything and we will try to work hand in hand, but how can we make to be short? How can we sensitize each person that they contribute to climate change, but that they, their choice is a solution? Okay, as you said, it's a difficult question, but um, let me tell you one thing that this is where the cultural, socio-cultural aspects of marketing come in. And already you can see when you try to buy your flight ticket, the average emission is mentioned there. So you have the choice of not choosing a, an airline, not boycotting altogether maybe, but not choosing an airline that has high emission rate. Similarly, as I said, you know, you see this advertisement like uh, you are buying a fridge and the advertisement is that I'm doing my bit. So it is an ethical advertisement and not a, no longer a, you know, the appealing to some neighbor's envy and you know, owner's pride kind of thing, that is gone. It is about how your purchase will add to the you know, uh, climate remediation, you know, climate change control, and so on and so forth. So that is already happening. And I was making this point when it was this International Renewable Energy Conference, that in India, I think people will buy renewable energy if it, if it is a little higher cost. And that socio-cultural aspect needs to be taken into account. In the, India, most people are not so profit or you know, so uh, oriented and they will buy it even if it's 10% more, but if they know that it actually helps the green revolution. Those need to be made more, uh, more global. Of course, there can be subsidies and incentivization for that kind of efforts. So where you, for, for example, say that you know, the emission is this much, or this is going to add to the you know, climate change uh, control in some way, that, that can be done. Uh, so that has to be, as you are, maybe you are trying to say, is to make a people's movement. So sure, it, it has to be a, you know, a one of the points in the agenda to make a environmental you know, control as a people's agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. I promise that we will finish by uh, two o'clock. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we will close this session.
I would like to thank the, the three uh, distinguished uh, speakers on the table. It was uh, uh, not a round table, but it worked quite, <laughs> quite nicely. Uh, I would uh, again express my uh, sincere thanks to Mr. Moses, uh, the European Union, especially the European Union delegation in, uh, is very much appreciating the global dialogue. So everybody uh, in the room is, uh, you please get my uh, personal thanks. And uh, we are looking for uh, next uh, uh, forum organized uh, by Global Dialogue. We appreciate very much uh, this kind of a little bit interactive uh, situation. So Mr. Moses, I, it's a pleasure working very closely with you. And uh, I give back the floor to the Master of Ceremony. Madame, thank you very much. And uh, let's meet after, after the, clo the closing word by the Master of Ceremony over uh, lunch. That was a very informative session. We would like the audience to give a round of applause, please. <laughs> the presentations will now be made to the distinguished participants of this session. Thank you, Mr. Pierik Fion, Dr. Goswami, Mr. Ghansham, and Mr. Devan. We will now watch a three-minute video on value before we move for lunch. If you've ever been in a car, it's a safe bet that there was a value product inside it. We have always been an integral part of your daily life. But where did it all begin? The story of Valio starts in 1923 in a small workshop in saint ouen a suburb of Paris with a man named Eugène Buisson. Little did he know that when he founded the Société Anonyme Française de Ferrado, he was beginning an adventure that would fill some of the finest chapters in automotive history. Right from the start, with the production of the very first friction materials in France, the company's products aimed to make driving easier. In less than 10 years, they were already equipping most cars produced in France. Not long after the war, the company brought drivers a new breakthrough. That breakthrough was called Ferlic, a new semi-automatic transmission system that replaces the clutch pedal with a control on the gear shift and that immediately popularized the electromagnetic clutch on small cars, such as the iconic Renault 4CV. As the usage of individual cars expanded, the former Little Parisian workshop started to conquer the world, setting up in Spain and Italy in the 60s, and then in the capital of the American automotive industry, Detroit, in 1970, and later expanding to Asia with Japan in the 80s and China in the 90s. In the meantime, the company's workshops developed innovations in fields ranging from thermal systems to lighting. In the 70s, they developed a new type of starter, the D6RA, a total game changer. It was lighter, more powerful. Once again, it's a huge success and would become standard on a wide range of cars, like maybe your mother's or your grandmother's. Eventually, the group grew to include up to 70 companies, such as Ferrodo, Cibier, Marshall, Ducellier. The time had come to unify them under a common name, Valio, the name of the Italian subsidiary, which means I am well in Latin. In the 90s, Valio led a new revolution. Parking enters a new phase as our engineers invent the first ultrasonic sensors for parking assistance. You know the beep, beep when you back up your car? That was Valio. In 2004, the company became a forerunner in the launch of stop-start technology, making it a pioneer in car electrification, a field in which Valio is today one of the global leaders. In 2011, we deployed Park for You, the world's first automatic parking assistance system and today, we're already inventing the car and the mobility of tomorrow, just as we've always done. In 2022, the world's first two cars certified for level three autonomy hit the market. Of course, they were equipped with Valio's LiDAR technology, the most advanced sensor essential for the development of the autonomous car. We've been driving innovation in the automotive industry for 100 years making cars cleaner, safer, smarter for all drivers in the world. And there are very, very few new cars today that are not equipped with at least one Valio technology. And this is just the beginning.
We will now break for lunch. We are back for session three at 2.30 p.m.